Hi, and welcome to the Mental Health Raw and Open podcast. I'm your host, Jody, and I created this show to have honest, candid conversations about mental health in an effort to help reduce the stigma. I will be issuing a trigger warning before each show as many of the topics we discuss may be highly sensitive for some. If you are having suicidal thoughts, please reach out to someone, go to your local hospital, or call a crisis line. In the States, you can call 1-800-273-8255 or in Canada, 1-833-456-4566. On today's show, we'll be discussing trauma, specifically childhood trauma, with Donald Cripps. Hi, Donald. Morning, Jody. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm good, thanks. You're good if I just call you Don? Yeah, Don's fine. <laughs> okay, that's good. Cool. So, um, Don is an advocate. Um, he is a survivor. Uh, he is an, an author. He has also just, I believe, gotten your license, uh, your counseling license? It's in process. That's excellent. So that's really, really cool. So he's soon to be a counselor as well. And I believe he also works with um, in a drug and uh, alcohol treatment center. Correct. Awesome. Yeah. So that's a, that's a lot going on there. Where do you want to start? Oh, I, I do a few things. Here yeah. There. It sounds it. Keep yourself busy, eh? Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your growing up. Well, my abuse... Uh, it started when I was very young. Okay. One of my earliest memories, um, I was about four. Okay. It was about a six-month period where the, the trauma and the abuse occurred primarily. Mm-hmm. I have two siblings. Um, and when the trauma was going on, um, my abuser used particular language. Okay. One of my siblings was also a target. That's their story to tell, so I'm not going to... Yeah, absolutely. Understood, yep. That. And I purposely use vague uh, pronouns in order to keep their privacy private and let yep. them... Yeah, of course. Share that. Um, but essentially, we both compared notes, or something happened where we both realized that the same language was being used. And once we knew that, it broke the lie, and we were able to discover that, okay, this is happening. Because the promise from the abuser was, do what I tell you, and your siblings won't get hurt. Uh, so he's gr- uh, definitely groomed you. We thought we were taking the bullet, but yeah, that wasn't the case. So and That's terrible. I'm so sorry to hear that. So once we figured that out, we told. Uh, fortunately for us, our, we were believed, and immediate action took place. Uh, how old were you when that happened, roughly? Uh, about four. About four still? Okay, that's cool. So you had the balls at four years old to be brave enough to tell somebody. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sort of not sure about the timeline because I know somewhere in there I turned five. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Four to five is still, you know, it's a toddler. <laughs> but um, we couldn't stay in the same state. Um, we were in a state where we had to be out of the state of where the accused was. Okay. The court case took two years to start to wow. finish. It was dragged out forever, uh, primarily because the abuser lied and said he didn't do it uh, for about a year and a half. And then his lawyer walked out on him and... <laughs> got a new lawyer and uh, they finished the trial and he was processed. Uh, did he, may I ask, did he serve time? He did, but it was minimal, um, <laughs> primarily because they botched how they took my testimony. Oh my and gosh. They assumed very little of me. Um, wow. And basically he took my voice. Uh, so I wasn't really happy about how that all went down. No, I guess not. That's awful. So they took me into judges' chambers, um, and we had to go back and forth by train, by plane, multiple times, meet with social workers. Uh, I mean, it was a very long process, all of everything. Um, He was charged with sodomy, uh, which is what first brought him in, and my name was put on the warrant. Um, So we 
gave testimony. I gave testimony privately with the judge in his chambers, and there was a bunch of adults around. Um, and then they didn't really prep me well. They just sort of halfway said, oh, by the way, we're going to bring your accuser in, and he's going to be in, in here in a minute. Same room? Yeah, same room. Oh, my God. So this was before the 80s. <laughs> we were one of the yeah, first I understand. Yeah. cases. So they didn't really have a good system, and they didn't have the option to videotape and keep it separate, which they really should have done yeah. for, for this case in particular, um, because both of us were very young. Um, I mean, my sibling is only like a year and a half older than me, so. That's so uh, awful for that age to have to deal with. Never mind the actual trauma, but the, the, the after effects of it that you can't even close that chapter on the book and begin to heal because the chapter is taking so long to end. Yeah. And they considered it aggravated sexual assault because of the number of occurrences and how young we were. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, I'm glad for that part. But I really wish they had done a better job of making me feel safe before. They oh, absolutely, yeah. And because I had an, I had a very uh, obvious freeze response. Uh, I mean, I can think back on the memory. I remember it vividly, and it was clear to me at four years old that I was having a freeze response. I didn't yeah. know the language or the words of it, but I knew what was happening, and I didn't believe them that they were going to keep me safe. Um, part of the problem was one of the earliest encounters I had with the social workers was they were offering me sodas and candy bars and, and asking me to tell them what happened. And my thought was, what the hell are you going to make me do? Mm -hmm. You know, it was the same thing. It, they were doing the same kind of grooming behavior and they didn't see the connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's crazy. Could you do this more terribly? <laughs> yeah. <you> <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, um, you know, I froze. I couldn't speak. He came in. He was growling and banging his chains around. And he was handcuffed hands and feet in his orange jumpsuit and uh, just threatening me. He said he was going to kill me, all these horrible things. Were there them. no guards or anything oh, with they were you? There. And but they don't care that he's threatening a child's life? They were letting him do that because they wanted to see if I could handle it in court. Wow. And I get that to a point, but they didn't check him in line or anything. I mean, they just let him go, and I just shut down, bro. Oh, for sure. Out of pure fear. Yeah. And I, I had just finished giving all the detailed account, like to the every little thing about what happened, everything I remembered um all the gory details and this came immediately after that so they decided for me that i couldn't handle it i was too young according to them and i'm like really because i lived through it so if i can live through it i can freaking handle it <laughs> and yes i want my my voice and i want a chance to say something in court and i want my testimony to stand mm -hmm. but they threw it out so they tabled it as far as they put me on paper as under other um, evidence of other abused victims. And that was part of the charges, but they he got a lesser sentence because of that. Well, I'm not sure what the sentencing's like in the States. I know up here it's pretty much a slap on the hand and a fine. Maybe you'll do nine months and then you're out the door. Yeah, he got, um, I think he was charged with, 14 years, but he only served seven. And I think he was released. On Jesus, eh? Oh, yeah. I, I, I'll i never understand that. If you're good, I don't care how good you are in prison, the last minute of your seventh year on the last hour is when you come out. There's no, there should be no for good behavior. It, it's a pet peeve of mine. We have it up here in the system often where you have to after 75 percent of a sentence is served the government has to reapply to keep that person in for the remainder of their sentence right which is like to me it's just absolutely so backwards and such a waste of time right it's crazy i'm all for you know rehabilitation as far as um 
pedophilia. So my background is in counseling. So I'm thinking of this in terms of clinical mental health from a therapeutic standpoint mm -hmm. as a victim. Um, and really all I can think that a pedophile is capable of um, obtaining is getting to a point where they can manage their urges and thoughts and um, not acting on them. Mm -hmm. Being a non-offending pedophile. But I, it's not curable. It doesn't go No, away. and it, it's an absolute catch-22 because if you're in that situation and unfortunately those are the feelings you have for whatever reason, right. what do you do? You can't really go to a counselor and say, oh, by the way, like I'm having... No counselor wants to work with you, right? So you can't get help. All they can do is try and control themselves. And for those who can't, you know, maybe it's about time that they try to figure out how they can not cure by any means because we know they can't but at least make it more manageable make maybe there can be i don't know groups monitored groups or something where they can like talk about it like an aa sort of idea um right. something where they can get those types of, of thoughts out without the fear of of acting on them right and i've heard of such groups um and a strange turning of events um recently across so social media is a an attempt of this group of pedophiles to attempt to rebrand themselves, um, putting a bow on the name pedo pedophile, and calling themselves MAPS. Which oh my gosh, I heard that. Yes. Minor attracted person, and uh, they're even trying to get added to the LGBTQIA spectrum no. as another option, which. No, 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 no. That's not an option of that at all. That is that is not an expression of sex. As part of those letters there, LGBTQT, etc. I absolutely think that's ridiculous. Right. Yeah, and the thing is, a minor is incapable of consent because they're a minor. So that exactly. will never change. So th it's a done deal. It's like, no, <laughs> this is yeah. a no. <laughs> How can Part it even that. be thought of as an option? <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. So, I, you know, I feel for them. I, I wish them all the best. I, I hope they can get the, the support that they need. And I think a 12-step model in community, they could heal. They could get to a place of functionality and, and not offending. And I, I'd be fine with that. Um, I'd even be open to interaction as long as they could maintain mm -hmm. the boundaries. Uh, unfortunately, with my experience, the maps that I've encountered do not have healthy boundaries, regardless of how far into recovery they claim to be. And uh, I'm sorry, I can't just take it your word. Oh, no, no, not in, in, in cases like that. It's always on, and, and it needs to be always. If your child says something, children don't make shit like that up. End of story. So if your child says something, you... You're right as a parent. You have to believe them and doubt whoever else and then check into it. But always, always trust your kids. Right. You know, like no child wants to come to their parent and say, oh, by the way, you know, I was molested. It's just not something that someone wants to do. But to be able to do it, especially at your age, that's incredibly brave and courageous. Yeah. So at four or five years old, um, I, I don't know if I was five or six by then. Um, I was faced with the aftermath and I, I continued to reel from it. Um, it in, interrupted my day and my night significantly for, for a good part of a decade or more um, before those symptoms abated and I was able to get them manageable. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't have a lot of support in my family. My family didn't know what to do. I mean, they were upset about it, but it was all this shame. So they didn't really want to talk about it. And I was left largely on my own to figure it all out. So that was hard. Yeah, uh, I bet. Yeah. Forced to go to counselors, which I hated <laughs> because I had a, a, a bad track record from the start. And yeah. It didn't get much better from there. I mean, I here and there, it helped to share my story. Um, but it was only just, you know, superficial and just on the surface and just not really much help. I moved a lot. Uh, I moved 50 times before I turned 18. Oh my God. My childhood continued to be crazy. Mm -hmm. Heard of the ACEs study? Mm -hmm. I 
took the aces and I found out that I have a 10 out of 10. I got nine. <laughs> it's like the only test I got 90% on in years. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not one you want to have. A I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm not happy to hear that, Judy. I wish your score was lower, um, but I'm guessing that, um, like myself, there's a second test. There's a set of resiliency questions. Uh, there are 14 of those, and um, you can then look at the the whole picture. So the Aces asks 10 questions that say, "What did you?" get exposed to what were you um what adversity did you survive as a child mm -hmm. and then the other 14 questions ask how did you survive that um and it basically looks at what supports and help and uh resiliency skills you gained along the way because people came along and helped you they, they made you feel loved they took care of you they showed you that they're not everyone in the world is going to hurt you and mm -hmm. so great website to go to for this is uh, www.aces2high.com. So okay. A-C-E-S-T-O-O-H-I-G-H.com. Okay, cool. You click the get your score, and the first 10 questions right at the top are the ACES study. And then there's a bunch of data. Um, so Kaiser Permanente did a study, uh, it was like 17 and a half thousand people. It was a huge study. They got a lot of data, and the data showed a lot of correlation between the things that you were exposed to as a child and um, how that can affect you in adult life uh, with health and mental health outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually like a ticking time bomb. It starts right from the point of abuse, and it goes until the abuse is processed. A lot of us don't know this, so we don't, we just stuff it and we're like, I don't want to deal with that ever. I'm just not, it's going to I'm not just not going to, yeah. <laughs> but what we don't realize is that trauma is attacking us. It's, this is the whole thing that really sucks. You know, first of all, this person chose to hurt us, chose to be selfish and do something awful. And then they pass that on to us. We got the consequences. Yes. They're yeah. crap. <laughs> and then not only that, but it goes into our body and it attacks us like cancer, thinking yes, that yeah. we're the problem. We're the broken thing. You know, that's what we think all, our whole life. I'm sure you've read the book. I think it's called um, uh, something about body stored in the trauma or uh, trauma stored in the body by. Uh, oh, I can't remember his name, but I'll think of it. As thinking, a... um, the body keeps the score. by. Yeah, the... that's it. Fantastic book. Yes. Yeah. It, it unpacked a lot for me. It's very high, uh, I don't know, high education level. I'm not sure. Like, it's very bookish. Mm -hmm. It's a technical language. So that's a bit off-putting. But, yeah, it's a, it's a great book. It, it really helps you understand how all these things are connected. Um, and I didn't know until, like, last October about this trauma attacking your body. And it literally will cause you to lose up to 20 years of your life, uh, have physical and mental health outcomes. Until I know it affects the stomach. So many people, you and I probably know, both know with IBS or Crohn's or, you yeah. know, con chronic gastritis or anything like that. It's all built up. In my opinion, it's likely all built up trauma. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I think I've seen a couple of your posts recently about that, you know, unprocessed lifelong trauma something to that effect. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's that. So, but here's the thing. This is the this is the um, medical part of it or the physiological part of it. Um, there's a thing called a telomere inside your cell. Um, and where that is, is, um, well, let me back up. The, the body is designed to heal itself. Uh, we have an amazing body that as we sleep, it heals. And every seven years, your body is replacing every cell in your body. Yep. So every seven years, you're new. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Refreshed. Reboot. <laughs> um, so the, the me that's me right now, all the cells that are me were never touched by my abuser, which is kind of cool. <laughs> I'm a new me. Yeah, so, exactly. Hands off, pal. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, so... In our cell, while we're sleeping, um, in the DNA, um, 
the DNA is sort of like an X and it's two strands that are twisted together. And around the outside of the DNA is this coating. Um, it's, it's sort of like a, the cap on the end of your shoelace, if you want to okay. something like that. And whereas the plastic around the shoelace end keeps the shoelace from uh, frazzling and unraveling, um, the telomere does a similar job. It keeps the DNA strands together because what they do is they unravel the DNA it copies itself and then it uses the copy to replace the cell or heal the cell or whatever it's doing. Okay. Then it ravels back. Well, the trauma goes down to the cell and attacks the telomere and makes the telomere get short. And over time, when the DNA is unraveling, the the telomere can't keep the two strands together and that DNA breaks apart, gets the cell gets sick and dies. And wherever that is in your body, that's what you get sick with. So that's literally what's happening. It's crazy. Yeah. So that's what's happening with the unprocessed trauma. And what we need to do is as soon as we are healthy enough and at a place of recovery enough where we can turn and address and process the trauma in pieces, not the whole thing, because it's too Yes, big. absolutely. But in pieces that we can manage with a counselor who knows how to do it, we can do skills like uh, pendulation is one of the, the treatment modalities. Uh, we can look into other things like tapping and EMDR mm -hmm. and back. And there's a lot of great other things to do. Even art therapy and any of the music or nonverbal types of therapies where there's parts of trauma that aren't verbal that you need to process, not just talk it out. Um, but then this other piece where you are processing um, the trauma so that it moves from wherever it is in your body, because it's that book, The Body Keeps the Score, tells you this. Yeah. Trauma stores in the body. It doesn't store in the brain. Once it's processed, though, it does go to the brain and store in long-term memory. Um, and then it stops. That attack on your cells, on the DNA, on the telomeres, that stops. Um, so the sooner we can do that, the sooner we stop the aftermath, the effects that our abuser handed to us, and we can start to heal and get better. So that's my yeah, that's, message to all survivors. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a great one, too. Um, I know personally, like, I have CPTSD, and I have gone into numerous doctors, and I say, I have CPTSD, and they're like, what's that? I'm like, okay, how do you not know? Like, it's almost like being an educational experience for them when I go into an appointment because I now have to explain something that's yet not in the DSM, but it describes so many things and, and accurately. And, and I have BPD, borderline personality disorder, and that's another thing is they cross over so tightly but the DSM doesn't have a CPTSD. It does have a borderline, so then you just get automatically listed in the borderline section, when in fact, half the people who have borderline don't have borderline, they have CPTSD. Right. Yeah, and another common misdiagnosis is bipolar. Um, so it's very common um, when you're being assessed, it's really important for survivors to let their assessor know that you have trauma in your history because you can get that inaccurate diagnosis of borderline or, or bipolar, and it's not true. And the, the whole thing about a diagnosis is it's not about labeling you, it's about getting you the correct treatment. Yes. You yeah. want the most accurate diagnosis because you want to get the treatment that fits what you need. And PTSD just isn't sufficient. CPTSD is much more appropriate because often the abuse happens in childhood. and because of that, we have developmental milestones that are interrupted, and we need to identify which milestones were missed and sort of play catch up to help um, support the survivor to full recovery. You know, it's like that incongruence. Um, mm -hmm. I see this a lot more with my um, survivors who have um, a, an addiction in addition. So they tried to self-medicate to manage yeah. symptoms of their trauma. And I totally get that, which was why I started in drug and alcohol. Um, but there's a, usually a huge incongruence in their biological and their internal age. So um, let's say they, they had 15 years of addictive history. Okay, so they, they acted on their addiction, they, they 
played that out. They were in relapse for a chunk total of 15 years. Let's say their trauma lasted 10 years. Okay, so you add both of those numbers together, that's now 25 years. So whatever their age is, let's say they're 40, 50, you know, let's say 50. Okay, so they're 50, their biological age is 50, but their internal age is 25. Yeah. So um, now I noticed myself through my healing path that I'm like stuck at certain ages. Um, I'm past them in one point, but I'm still, it's almost like a reference point, like um, before or after the abuse. And for me, it's before or after my mom died. She died when I was 19. So my life splits then. So for me uh, to, to separate the two, I'll think, oh, was it before my mom died or was it after my mom died? And then was it before trauma or after trauma? So I kind of like have those those levels where I'm somewhat stuck in an age, I guess, um, because they have not been processed entirely. Yeah. I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, no, that's OK. It's all it's OK. Mom is, is tough. Um, yeah, it's uh, it, it was it's a hard one. She was six since I was 13. So it, uh, it was it's a really long process. And again, it was back in like 80s and not everyone. People didn't have cancer like they have cancer now. It just wasn't as, as talked about or as widely known. So and the treatments back then were barbaric as well. So I'm I'm. I'm it's, I'm glad for those who have any sort of illness now that the treatments have improved tenfold at least. Yeah. So. Yeah. So um, when you have somebody who has that incongruence with their age, um, because you're subtracting the years of trauma and the years of addiction um, from your biological age, it sometimes takes time to bring those years together and back to congruence. Um, so that's part of the work of CPTSD is to bring those into alignment and make sure that the, the survivor has all the supports that they need. Mm -hmm. PTSD, again, it just doesn't meet those requirements. And the DSM promised to put um, CPTSD in the DSM-5. Yes, it was and it's not there. I looked at it the other day at an appointment. It is definitely not there. Yeah, it's so frustrating because it's like, okay, so you just negated treatment for all of us. And yeah. there's... Just in the U.S., I don't, I'm not sure the population of Canada, but in the U.S., it's about 50 million survivors. So if you just take the population of the U.S., like just, I think there's a, if you Google search like U.S. population, there's a counter that continues to go nonstop. So you just like plunk into whatever the number is right now. And then you take, um, divide that in half, and that's your male or female. And then, uh, and I'm not trying to negate uh, trans or other uh, other genders. Uh, I'm just mm -hmm. no, I hear you. Letting you know the math. For the sake of the story. <laughs> right. For this math here, you know, kudos to to all those who are outside of those norms. Uh, I get that. But um, you you divide it in half, and then from there you cut that number in four, and it's one in four uh, is a female survivor before they turn 18 has been sexually assaulted. And that's that number. And then you do the, the math again, get back down to that 50%, and then take that number and cut it into six. And it's one in six for males before they turn 18. And then those two numbers together is um, above now. Uh, I mean, I did this math years ago, so it's it's been added to since. Um, but it was 50 million back then. It's astonishing. It honestly is like how you can look at that and not go back to trauma as a root and said you're just handing out like a BPD like candy and then according medicine, there's no medicine for BPD. So they give you medications for all the other things which come with it, which is same things that come with CPTSD, your depression, your anxiety, your flashbacks, blah, 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 blah. Right. So then you end up being medicated for something you're not really sure you even have. Yeah, and one of the tests is uh, many who are diagnosed borderline or bipolar and are given these medications, many of them who are survivors go off the meds because they weren't really doing anything anyway. And you can manage your symptoms. I mean, it, it is a challenge for sure um, to find ways to manage your symptoms otherwise, which is ultimately the goal because even um, 
depression meds. You know, most of those are not supposed to be on for more than four weeks, six months at the max, because after that, they basically are useless. They, you actually are less depressed off of them, <laughs> less anxious off of them than you are staying on them. Um, so the goal is that those should be short-term use. And a lot of doctors have been prescribing those for decades. And oh, some absolutely. Like benzos, um, they have an addictive point to them where you can't just cold cut somebody off of them. You actually have to taper them off because mm-hmm. it can cause uh, seizures if you don't. I know Ativan is huge in the States. We use more clonazepam up here than Ativan. Um, but I know that there's like a huge Ativan addiction problem. It's just, and and it's by all sorts of groups, all cultures and all ages. Right. Yeah. It, it doesn't discriminate. Uh, same as, as opiate addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say opiate is probably our worst and secondary would be uh, cocaine and crack. And then third would be benzos. Um, here in the states, um, and with the opiates really high with fentanyl right now, um, the cartel, the drug cartel, has kind of changed its tack, and right now it's trying to cut fentanyl into everything, whatever the drug is, even the pills that you can buy off the, the dark web, um, like benzos. Even um, they're going to take those broken pills, they're going to repress them into a mold. It looks like a benzo. It looks like the the FDA approved drug, but it's got whatever it is inside of it. All these you know, it doesn't even make sense to me. Like I, <laughs> thinking as a drug dealer here for a second, but if I'm a drug dealer, I presume I, I sell drugs and I want people to come back to right. keep my business going. So why would I kill them? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. But here's what they're trying to do. They don't really care how many people die in the process. And that's that's kind of the bottom line there. The, the thing is, they're looking to hook everyone into heroin and not just a little bit, not just like a bag or two to get by. They want you so dependent on on heroin that you need bundles of it, bricks of it, like mm-hmm. ounces and ounces um, of it. That's or, crazy. Or, um, grams and grams of it. Uh, <laughs> I've got my measurements wrong there. <laughs> but. Yeah, so that's the goal. They're they're trying to hook everyone on that, and that's why they're putting they're cutting it into marijuana. They're cutting it into um, uh, cocaine and crack and and all these other drugs. And people are like, well, that's weird. That doesn't make any sense. Why are they doing that? It's because they want more money. They want more, more addicts, more money, money, and, and the few that yeah. die in the meantime, who cares? Yeah, right. Because there's always going to be somebody else who yeah. wants and needs. And um, yeah, it, it's terrifying what's out there on the street right now. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So I work with, I have uh, 90 patients. I'm supposed to only have 70, but the, we're in a, a epidemic, so I have 90 currently. Wow. And it's hard to keep up with them, just that group per month. Oh, I guess, that's a ridiculous amount of people, really. <laughs> so. Yeah, but I see it day in and day out, and people are dropping left and right. So. It's so sad, really. It's just they got to do something, and and cutting it off of dying cancer patients isn't probably the best idea. You have there's got to be a common sense point in here somewhere. Right. Yeah. So, um, and I can tell you, based on my caseload, a very high percentage of those are, have a trauma background. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Specifically are from um, a sexual assault trauma background. Um, many have other kinds of trauma, but that's that's the common denominator. I don't remember much of my early 20s, my friend. After my mom died, I went traveling for a little while. And then when I got back, I wasn't sure what to do. So I went to college and basically partied for the next five years. Um, I dabbled with anything and everything except for crack and heroin um, to not have to think. Basic problem. Just no, I don't want to deal with it right now. It's creeping up in the back of my mind. I can feel it wanting to come out, so I need to numb it. So you do whatever you can to shut it out because at that time, I'm still having fun. I'm just recovering from my mom's death. I want to play soccer. I want to hang out with my friends. I don't want to deal with being having to heal from all these horrors that I'm going to remember anyway. 
Right. It's just kind of like put it off for a little while, you know? Yeah. And all of that stuff just surfaces, um, which is actually evidence that your body is getting ready to be able to deal with it. Um, but we don't always see that. <laughs> yeah. Or we don't want to, we're not ready to deal with it. Absolutely. So, yeah. So those intrusive um, thoughts and memories and flashbacks uh, that are happening and, occur and feeling like they're happening right now, um, they creep into our days and into our nights and they interrupt and interrupt and interrupt. And we just have to reel out of the, the aftermath of that. Uh, and that's the real challenge for survivors. It is. And it's a, it's an ongoing challenge. It's not like, you know, there's a checklist of 10 things to do. And as soon as you're done that, like, woohoo, I'm healed. It's, it's a lifelong process in my opinion for most I'm people. Healed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you pass 10 and you're at the door, you know, I but wish it were that easy. Yeah. Oh God. Something I found is that there are a lot of dimensions. You know, I think of us like we're not a flat piece of paper. We have dimension, right? Uh, and there's different dimensions and parts of who we are. So we have a body, we have a heart, we have a soul, we have a mind, we have emotions. Um, and they're just different parts of us, even a, a personal self, a professional self. There's all these different dimensions. And each of us could probably identify various other facets mm -hmm. important to us. So the point is, as survivors, the trauma happened to all of that part of us. Um, so our treatment and our recovery and our healing, it needs to address all of those areas too. Many of us don't have the first idea, well, how do I yeah. heal myself emotionally? How do I heal myself spiritually? How do I heal myself mentally and physically? We pretty much only focus on the physical and just try to medicate that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I had a bunch going on. Like when I was a kid, because I was sodomized, um, there was a physiological issue. And uh, I don't know how far you want to go, but. Uh, All open. We're on open here. <laughs> so it, I had to deal with bleeding. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. A torn. Um, I was torn. I was a, a little yeah. child and mm -hmm. adult male sodomized me. So it hurt. And um, yeah. I had to deal with that. I had to drink uh, mineral oil for 10 years. It was disgusting. Um, it was a way to uh, decrease the swelling in my colon. Wow. I didn't know that. They did a scan and they found out that that's, it was enlarged and um, their treatment was drink mineral oil for a decade and that'll make it all better. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, but, and the other thing that I struggled with is it, it led me to have accidents from time to time. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, that's quite common from what I've, I've read about male survivors. Yeah. So uh, it was really embarrassing and a stigma. And I mean, into my forties, I've had issues that I've, you know, I deal with it, I clean it up, I take care of it. Um, I know how to manage it now, but it still bothers me that he has that power over me, that my body doesn't do what it's supposed to, mm -hmm. it hasn't fully healed. So like, it's like I can't get away. Yeah. I'm trapped in a body that doesn't want to cooperate. Yeah. Uh, it is what it is. Um, it's just one of the unfortunate things. So uh, another area, um, I had terrible recurring nightmares for over a decade. Yes. I also had um, sleep paralysis. And uh, all of this developed into sleep apnea, which I left untreated for probably 30 years before. Oh, I really? Eh? Yeah. And I did the math of it, and I was like, okay, so when I finally did the sleep study, um, and I had a great place. Um, I live in central PA. So I went to Hershey and they have a great sleep, sleep clinic there. You get to actually get the equipment and take it home and do the study in your own bed. Bring oh, that's bed. cool. It just records it. Well, I had what I thought was a typical night's sleep. I had 314 occurrences of apnea where I stopped breathing. And it was like, and that. in a night, you know, and catch my breath and start breathing again. Yeah. Wow. So, and I, I thought that was a normal night's sleep and I didn't know that it was that much a night. So I did the math like, okay, so if I haven't dealt with this for 30 years, 
times 365 times 314 times a night. I mean, it was in the millions. I'm like, wow, I could have died a million times. Literally, yeah. How in the world am I still alive? And then it hit me like, okay, so I'm a walking miracle. And I, I'm very thankful to be alive. Um, I have a wife. I have four boys. And I, I want to be I saw alive. pictures of your kids, by the way. They're all ridiculously cute. They are. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm very blessed. Um, so, uh, and I'm thankful for them. So I'm glad to be on a, a CPAP now. Um, it's kind of annoying to have a, a hose attached every night. <laughs> yeah, every- yeah. But, you know, it is what it is, and I can I can deal with it. because Have those numbers dropped as you heal over the years? Yeah. With the CPAP, um, it goes down to about eight per night. And then when those eight occur, the machine kicks in and breathes for me and helps me to get started breathing again much faster. Okay. So okay. It basically wipes it to zero. Oh, that's good. So do you find yourself, do you sleep through the night now, or do you still have deal with nightmares and shit? Very, very rarely. Um, here and there, I do have them, um, but they, they don't bother me the same anymore. They don't have the same emotional attachment. No. Good. They did for a long time, and I would wake up just in a cold sweat, my heart racing, and I couldn't get back to sleep, and just disruption of sleep for a long time. So that's also why the paralysis occurred. Um, and for those who don't know, sleep paralysis is... The time when you're going to sleep, you're falling asleep, or you're waking up. Most of us are asleep during that, and our body goes into paralysis so that, you know, as we're fighting the pirates and whatever, swashbuckling in our dreams, <laughs> not like chopping everything to, to pieces in our bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, but when you are awake during that time, it can be very terrifying, and it actually feels like something is attacking you. So you feel like there's a presence behind you and you can't turn and you can't see them because you can't move. Or it feels like it's sitting on your chest and it's pushing down and you can't breathe. Uh, And it can be quite terrifying because it can last for several minutes at a time. Wow. And I had that experience many, many times. And it was just recurring, um, couldn't get away from it. And I just was trapped, feeling frozen in my body and just feeling like something is attacking me. And uh, it just added to the terror of nightmares. Mm-hmm. And this is just some of the stuff that survivors have to deal with yeah. on an ongoing basis. I mean, I'm just scratching the surface of some of the aftermath and the effects, the, the things that we live with day in and day out. Um, you can have intrusive memories. You can dissociate. I mean, I live with like chronic hyper uh, hypersensitivity, so I am aware of my surroundings and everything that's in them twenty four seven. Even when I'm asleep, I know where my cat is. It's like I can't not be on alert. That's something I haven't been able to um, get rid of. It's almost like a, a, my ultimate safety mechanism. Right. So it's like the last thing that you want to hold on to, because once you let go of those, you feel quite vulnerable. Right. Right. And you have to obviously have something to replace it with. That's a healthy coping mechanism. Right. Yeah. And I would say um, a book that has really helped me with that, that piece in particular, that hypervigilance um, is Healing from Trauma by Jasmine Lee Corey. Uh, Jasmine with no E. Um, She's a... um, I think a licensed social worker and a rape survivor um, writes very direct. Uh, I like the chapters. They're clean. They're short to the point. Uh, and each chapter ends with 10 takeaways from the chapter. And they just, Oh, that's good. In all the different dimensions of what's going on and, and breaks down that hypervigilant state um, describes it sort of like a battery and it's like you're stacking on top of itself. And my therapist describes it as an onion and you're unpeeling all the layers to get to the core kind of thing. Yeah, that's a that's a great metaphor. Yeah, it's helpful. Um, so, yeah, it, it's challenging to deal with with all of this um, and to educate yourself, um, particularly because most of us are on our own. Our family's like, yeah, I don't know how to help you. Good luck with that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Call me when you're healed. Right. We'll talk then. Yeah. Okay, not now. <laughs> exactly. <sighs> yeah. So, uh, you know, we have we find each other 
and uh, we can kind of co-heal in, in community. And I'm so thankful that we live in a world where we can be connected across social media. Uh, that's really helped a lot for me um, just to be connected with other survivors mm -hmm. on all the different platforms and to find ways to connect. And then I feel less alone. Oh, absolutely. It helps when you know others are suffering the same types of ordeals or, or thoughts or, or, you know, um, feeling alone can make it can literally be life or death. Um, isolation is deadly. Humans need contact from other human beings to survive and to thrive. Right. Yeah. And for me, the, the two things that were the most significant in helping me deal with my trauma uh, from a young age i found music uh and i found faith um so i i believe in a higher power and um for me that was very significant so um when i activate that dimension you know my spiritual dimension i think of it in terms of you know i make the cross so i think of me and my higher power connecting vertically and then I think of me and other people connecting horizontally. And when okay, I yeah. The cross, mm -hmm. I must be good because then I have that connection. And when I'm not doing those two things, that's when I tend to be heading towards, you know, bad thoughts, bad coping strategies. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. I, I know myself with BPD, it's like rapid cycling. So like one hour I can be fine and the next hour I might be like literally suicidal and then nothing really has to happen. It's just like the going on this constant roller coaster um, and it's difficult because it's not and they it's a disorder, not an illness. So it's basically entirely tra caused by trauma. Right. Right. So and then you start again where you have to go back and be willing to peel back all those layers of the onions to get through all that shit to the, the core of everything and my core is abandonment and everything or all my trauma and everything else revolves around that so is that your deep wound that's my deepest wound yeah and all my fears and everything uh, that i deal with now all come back to it may take 10 steps to get back there but it, it all comes back to abandonment at the end yeah i'm i work at a faith-based practice um and i'm thankful that it's not the kind that shoves it down your throat you know we don't proselytize we just meet our clients where they're at so you know i, I had a client who was muslim for example and that's fine mm -hmm. he returned to his faith and he started going back to the mosque and praying and connecting with allah and that was great we're happy to see that he had that reconnection um so it really it's it's okay whatever the the faith perspective is we just want you activating <laughs> in some way whatever that is for you mm -hmm. uh, and uh we use a, a an approach called formational prayer and it is basically a model that was developed to bring the the faith perspective and clinical therapy together to kind of meet and uh it sort of, it makes a v going down but it goes down to what we identify as the deep wound and it goes back up the other side. Okay. It's kind of structured around the 23rd Psalm, uh, which is um, the Lord is my shepherd. Uh, okay, yep. Psalm. And uh, the, in the Psalm itself, it talks about um, even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, um, he's with me. And he actually builds a table <laughs> right for you in front of your enemies and you sit and you have food <laughs> and you're like yeah i'm just eating here <laughs> yeah where was that during world war ii <laughs> <laughs> right so you're there and it, and it, it's the place where you address and deal with the deep wound um so that's that's kind of the thing so we have the life situation and that that leads us to try to deal with it in the best possible way we can which is usually dysfunctional behavior <laughs> yes you repeat what you know too right right i mean we try our best but we're human so yes. it is what it is and then we have an emotional uh reaction to that dysfunctional behavior and then that sticks around long enough to where we start believing that what we're feeling emotionally is true and we start to believe false beliefs and lies that we tell ourselves 
and then that goes down to the deep loop. So that's kind of the left side of the V going down. And I think of it as making the V of the valley of the shadow of death. And um, you go sit at a table and you, you call on God. Okay, God, can you come help me deal with this deep wound? And then he meets you there and, and you do the work of basically going back the other side, taking each piece and correcting it and healing it until you get out of the valley and, and you're into recovery. So that's the model. Uh, that's what it looks like, but it's it's accessing your faith perspective to go through the pieces of that. Oh, that's good. It's, uh, to me, like I'm I'm not stuck. I wasn't re- raised in any religion. I've I've done quite a bit of reading, and I found myself pulled more towards Buddhism um, and their concepts of things, um, which is just basically compassion. Buddhism it just is, evolves off compassion, and I think that if everyone in the world could just have compassion. This would be a much better place, yeah. right? Like, just accept people for what they are. It doesn't really matter if you and I have different religions or different whatever. Every human being has something in common with someone else. Right. Yeah, and we need to meet at those places of intersection, of, of commonality. Yeah. Where our values and our ethics meet. Mm-hmm. Find those those points to connect with. Absolutely. Um, tell me a bit about your book. Okay, so I have a book, um, and uh, here's here's the book. It's called The Packing House. Cool. Um, now, this was in print for five whole months before my publisher went out of print, and now it is only available by third-party sellers who are trying to sell it for, like, $800. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So I contacted them and said, hey, I'm the author. I'd like a few more copies. Can I buy this at a, you know, reasonable, not ridiculous rate? Oh, no. Nope. <laughs> so, so what has to happen? It has to go through a different publisher now? Um, yeah, I'm working. So the rights reverted back to me. Um, when my publisher went out of business, um, it broke the terms of the contract, which was that it was going to be out and in print and available. So because of that, the rights revert back to me. So that means I have right. Um, immediately the month after they closed, uh, which is now about two years ago, um, to uh, submit and try to find a new publisher. But it's difficult to republish a book. It has I was going to say, that must be quite a challenge because it's already there. Like, it's already an existing piece, right? And you can still find it online. Um, Amazon has it, and, like, I think I have 25 uh, reviews. Um, it's pretty highly rated on Goodreads f- and Amazon. I followed a link. I think it was on your website or somewhere. It took me to part of the story. Yeah. And I was reading that last night, and I was just like, "Wow, that's that's inc- great, incredible stuff, man." Thank you. You write very well. Thanks. Yeah, it's. Um, I found a publisher that uses an algorithm to test uh, readers and the reader response to it. So it's sort of a new platform. It's kind of innovative, but it's pretty risky because the whole book is online right now. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's temporary. It's not going to be forever. It's not free forever, people. <laughs> um, but right now, if a reader would like to go, they can go on Inkit, which is the website, I-N-K-I-T-T. Um, there's even a, an app you can download, and you can access the book. So the book title is The Packing House. Um, it's the Shakespearean idea of to send somebody packing, uh, essentially running away. And that was the theme. So I started with the idea of what what if there was a family where everyone was kind of running from their problems? Nobody dealt with their stuff. And that's sort of the environment that my main character starts in. And I... Yeah, I I was wondering, I was going to ask you, is your main character based off of um, personal experiences in any way? Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually, um, I didn't admit to this at first. Um, I was going to keep that kind of private, but I've, I've come to terms with, you know, I'm comfortable with just owning the fact that this is my survivor story. Um, and I just <laughs> call it out straight that way. Good. That's, that's awesome. Uh, I think of it in terms of, you know, as a survivor, there's a, there's an effect called splintering and it's where your parts of yourself fracture and and break and the pieces of you are shattered um essentially so as you're as you're looking at you know finding your voice and recovering and healing you know to tell your story 
um, it might be one of these splintered selves. So I think of the main character in my book, Joel, as my splintered self. Um, and it allowed me to get really close to the ugly, icky parts, because I, I go there. Mm-hmm. I face all of it. I mean, it's pretty intense. So major, major trigger warning. Um, there are periods of dissociation. The nightmares are there. Like, all the stuff is there. It's all there. And But I, I unpack it as as you go forward because it's all about turning and facing it it's at mm-hmm. first running away from it uh, no i don't want to deal with it and then what would cause me to have to stop and and want to turn and face with face it and deal with it mm-hmm. that's that's essentially the story now it's actually planned as two books and i'm currently writing book two um book two takes it further so book one i would say takes you from Victim to survivor. Okay. And I use a model of recovery that goes victim, survivor, adapter, thriver, and overcomer. Okay. For me, writing the book, and even especially writing the second book, and getting a master's in clinical mental health, and doing work with trauma survivors, um, kind of paying it forward, that all of that is helping me to get and move into this uh, overcomer stage. So sort of like you alluded to before, there's parts of you who are this age and that age and use points of reference. You know, I think as we recover, the different dimensions of us too are at different stages of recovery. Mm-hmm. And we sort of move all of them forward, <laughs> mishmash, and uh, eventually we'll all kind of be caught up to, okay, we're all at, you know, adapter stage. We're all at thriver stage. Okay, now we're all at overcomer stage. Woohoo. And that's that's kind of where I'm at with it. Um, the book really helped me with that, and I'm getting a lot of feedback from survivors in particular who read it that say it resonated strongly. It it articulated so much of what they lived through. Mm-hmm. I, I don't think very many people go into um, – I know when I'm writing my book, too, I'm triggering myself sometimes because I'm going through memories of when I was like four and five and six years old. Um, And that's at the point where I I just stop writing for a little while. I put it away until I can, you know, get back in an emotional. I find if I'm too rational, I don't write well. But if I'm too emotional, I don't write well. So it's kind of a fine balance in the middle to to reach that audience and, and really, really touch them because you know that there's so many people out there that have gone through exactly that. They're feeling these feelings that you're feeling and you're actually expressing them. And I've been told from my writing, people are like, well, thank you, because that's what I think. or That's what I've wanted to say. Or I, I, I didn't have, you know, the, the courage to go ahead and say um, to have a book to, to relate to that is, is fantastic. So well done on that. Yeah, and I particularly wanted to represent male survivors, um, since I'm one of them. <laughs> and there's very few books out there that, that do. Absolutely. Yeah. Very, very few. And I'm very thankful for those that are out there and in existence. There are some. Um, but I wanted to join those ranks. And I wanted to add a story and a voice that was different from what's already out there to just multiply and amplify the voice of survivors. So that's the goal of the book. And with this website, what they do is as a reader starts reading, it tracks how quickly they read a chapter. Do they go on to the next chapter? How many chapters in a row do they read? Um, do they like it? Do they put a review on the end? Um, what do they rate it? And all of that. So it, it unpacks the data of that. And I actually get to see all that data, which is pretty cool. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. On about which chapters resonated, which chapter might need a little work if I ever got it republished to make sure that they don't stop turning the pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it just gives me a lot of information that's very useful. Um, I mean, I I was shocked. I have readers around the world. I have readers in Africa and Australia and Canada and UK and the US. I'm like, oh my gosh, wow, (laughs) thank you. (laughs) But um, so the, the... algorithm collects the data and it's going to decide whether my book is worth the risk to publish because if it tells them that no this is a really good book and people are reading it and they're giving it really high reviews 
then it has a shot at getting published. So right now it's 76% through collecting all the data. I have 20 Oh, that's very cool. Is this a paid? Do you have to pay for that? I assume. Yeah. No. Nope. Yeah. I, I can submit it and, and post it up and then just wait through the process and keep sharing that it's out there and available and please go read it and post your honest review and I'm happy with whatever that is. Um, but so far I've got five out of five star, 13 total reviews. Um, it's been read cover to cover at least 40 times. Um, it's got like almost 3,000 chapter reads. There's only Oh, 40. that's awesome. So it's it's got a lot of data. Um, I think I got through about six or seven chapters on my phone last night, so it was really good. It was easy to read. Easy, but not easy, if that makes sense. A difficult subject, but um, easy to feel how you were feeling. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I, I hope it will um, be easy to continue reading uh, to the end. And then I also have published um, and posted the first few chapters of book two. Okay. Um, actually further than that, but I haven't shared all that online yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, but so I'm about I'm coming up towards the end of the first third of book two and I've sort of mapped out what I'm doing in book two. Um, book two is much more direct in facing the abuser. Um, it deals with the court case and the psychological um, manipulation and gaslighting of the abuser. Um, and it, there are other victims than just the main character in book two. And all of that comes out um as part of book two and i have ways of resetting everything so um it, yeah it, i look forward to reading it that's very cool yeah so um uh, if you, you send me a link actually send mm -hmm. me a link to your that site with the ink kit and i'll uh tweet it out i'll put it in my favorites and then i'll just keep sending it out sure it's currently my pin tweet so you can easily follow me on twitter um so twitter.com slash GD Cribs, C R I B B S. And um, from there, right at the top is the pin tweet. There's the link right there, and you can go to the story. Um, and then if you click the hyperlink inside of Inkit that says GD Cribs, uh, it will go to all my books, and you'll see the packing house, and you'll see Unpacking the Past. Which is Very cool. cool. You must be proud. You should be proud. I am. Yeah. Good. And Eventually, I want to make a, a guide for therapists. I want them to be able to um, take the book and use it as bibliotherapy in session and kind of unpack what issues came up in chapter one, chapter two, and so forth to have talking points. And mm -hmm. That almost sounds like it would be a fantastic uh, a group peer support idea, you know, um, working through like a mental health book that everyone's read and then coming back and discussing how each chapter has affected each person in a different manner, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, I hope that it will inspire others to write their stories. Um, I definitely was inspired by several books. Um, I, make a lot of allusion in book one, The Packing House, to the books Speak by Laurie Hulse Anderson and Scars by Cheryl Rainfield. Um, and that's a, another uh, trauma survivor story uh, that deals with cutting. Okay, yeah. And uh, it's a po very powerful book. Speak just hit its 20th anniversary, and Laurie Hulse just published um, another book called Shout, which is the follow-up. Uh, it's a whole book of poetry. Very powerful. Got eight starred reviews. Wow. It's it's wonderful. And um, both were very inspiring and, and uh, helped me to kind of figure out the angle for how to tell my story. Book two, uh, Unpacking the Past, is actually modeled off of a more recent book that just came out. Very highly um, award-winning book uh, called Sadie by Courtney Summers. Very, very powerful. Uh, a young lady who's kind of on her own. Her mom is sort of checked out, maybe on drugs, and uh, she sort of raises her younger sister. And at the beginning of the story, her sister winds up killed. Oh, my. She was uh, sexually assaulted and then murdered by her assaulter. And wow. the sister goes off and says, you know what, I'm going to go find this guy and I'm going to kill him. 
and it follows a podcast as um, the podcast is trying to find where is this girl she goes missing and they're trying to track her and the reader is reading and the reader is a few chapters ahead of where the podcast is so they kind of go back and forth and you're like ah oh my <laughs> god all the way to the very last page i mean you can't it's breathtaking and visceral and just shredded me to, to pieces uh, very very powerful story yeah i'll definitely have to put that i have about 30 books on my list to read but i'll add that to it as well yeah, yeah. for sure so, and when you read book two you'll understand the connection to sadie um and hopefully uh if you've read speak or if you read speak and and scars you'll see the connection in the packing house so awesome uh, self-harm is one that there's like literally I, that I've seen maybe half a dozen books on. It's not a, a topic that is spoken about, never mind written about very often. So kudos to her for having the courage to put all that out there, um, especially with the increase. I deal with a lot of kids through Twitter and the increase in, in kids self-harming is just, you know, it's astounding, absolutely astounding. I highly recommend Scars as a great read for that. And um, Cheryl is an amazing advocate for survivors. Um, she was a victim of not only sexual abuse, but ritual sexual abuse. Oh my gosh. And um, she dealt with cutting as one of her ways of co coping. Yeah. And that was the first book. In fact, the cover of her arms and all the, the cuts up each arm, uh, it's literally her arms on the cover at age 19. Wow. Good for her. She's got four books out. I think another one is on the way. Um, so very uh, thankful to call her friend. She's a Canadian author. Um, Yay, Canada! <laughs> <laughs> so she's a great, great read. All of her books, I highly recommend them. And she's a wonderful person. Cool. That's awesome. I will definitely be having a read. Mm -hmm. So um, what else can we ever want to ask you about? Uh, Bristlecone, tell me a little bit about that. Oh, sure. Um, so about two years ago, um, I had just finished my um, master's degree, um, was just turned in and completed notice at my um, previous job and before I went into drug and alcohol counseling full time. And the day before I started <laughs> at my new job, I was interviewed to be a member of the Bristlecone Project. So there's a group out there. Uh, the website is oneinsix.org. Uh, this is specifically a website for male survivors. Um, so one in six is the statistic that one in six males is a victim of sexual assault before they turn 18. Um, at the website, they have a ton of information. They dispel de the myths and they provide profiles of survivors. Uh, now there's, they're in the hundreds, and we're actually, we just got, went international. Uh, oh, fantastic. Include, um, Canada and the UK and Australia. Um, so there are representatives there. Um, and, and this. My interview was about three hours. Um, they did all this videotape of it, took pictures. And they posted my profile up there. Now, this is a nonprofit, so <laughs> on their own time, they're they're working to edit the videos down to shareable increments. But what they mm -hmm. do, they do a tour, and they will set up an an art gallery of all of our portraits and description of each of us, and then we're invited whenever we want to go to attend these um, and just present, you know, here's examples of male survivors. Um, that's awesome. I'd heard of one in six before, but I didn't know that it did that project. And that's, that's awesome. I think it's huge now, especially for, for to get males talking in any possible way you can. Um, and many of us are in um, the counseling field. Many of us are advocates. Many of us are doing active things. We have organizations that reach out to male survivors and, and just try to um, support and provide positive uh, examples of recovery. Um, and it hopefully helps people feel less alone mm -hmm. among male survivors. So awesome. yeah, the bristlecone is represented on a tree. It's a kind of a pine tree that can 
grow in the most adverse conditions ever with like no water <laughs> up on a mountain in a clump of rocks <laughs> <laughs> like, no dirt and yeah. just, it grows and it, they're amazing so um that's the symbol for the, the male survivor oh that's awesome that's really cool and quickly before we wrap up tell me about oprah oh yes <laughs> i just so, caught a clip of that when you posted and i was like oprah what the hell's going on <laughs> yeah. so uh, i had the privilege as an advocate as a survivor and being among the male survivors um i've also attended a weekend of recovery which is uh, previously affiliated with malesurvivor.org has now um, separated and become its own 503b whatever nonprofit. Um, so it's called Men Healing, and they provide weekends of recovery where you can go and attend a conference with other survivors and heal together in community. Um, Fantastic. Very helpful. There's another one that's in Pennsylvania. Um, that's also very good. I uh, haven't been to that one yet, but I do want to go. Um, so we were invited because we were from these populations to go attend a documentary up in New York. Um, and Oprah was posting, <clears throat> this is um, two men who are victims and survivors of um, Michael Jackson. Oh, okay. Uh, so the documentary was called um, Leaving Neverland. Yes. Yep. The portion that Oprah posted, the, the discussion after that, is called after Neverland. Okay. So if you look online, uh, I think it's through HBO and you can find clips on YouTube, but all of After Neverland is on YouTube. I believe it's broken down into six segments because um, they set it up to have space for commercials. Mm -hmm. um, but we were there. So we were in person. The entire audience is made up of survivors. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be asked to go sit in the front row. Uh, I was right in front of the director. Uh, feet away from Oprah um, and she interviewed these two men and the director and just uh, you know we watched all four hours of the documentary and I can tell you um, it was very heartbreaking to to have you know a childhood uh, music legend to um, be shown in a different light mm -hmm. truth shined on him but it it shows the example of you know when you when you're a pedophile, you groom not only the victim, but you can groom the family. And for Michael Jackson, he groomed the world. Yeah. He presented himself to be this, you know, I'm this great person. And he had an incredible musical talent, which is very unfortunate that that also hid this dark secret. Yeah. Um, and that it's, it's made very clear. I mean, I, I cannot deny the fact, uh, having watched the documentary. Uh, and a lot of... Michael Jackson apologists will come out of the woodwork attacking you. So if you say anything on social media after you watch it, be prepared. Be prepared because I'm telling you, a hundred to a thousand people will come at you right then, immediately attacking you and throwing all this evidence at you and trying to gaslight you all about, you know. It's so funny when someone dies, you put them on. I did this with my mom, even like when she passed away. It's like she's on a, you put them on a pedestal. So you're almost like afraid to say anything bad about them because they can't defend themselves or how dare you think badly of the dead or whatever, whatever it may be. But the point is that she was a person and she had depression and she made a lot of mistakes. Doesn't matter whether when or when she died, or if she died young or if she died old, that is she tried her best to do what she could with what she had. Right. And very similar for Michael Jackson. So, you know, it, it is what it is. And it's the truth. So Oprah said, you know, I'm going to take a bullet for this. And I'm okay with that. Because she said, look, I did all these hundreds of shows about um, sexual assault survivors. And she said, I never got to the point that this got to in four hours. But she said, it's worth taking that hit because she wants the information out there. She wants parents to know. She wants them to see because it was, it's a destruction. And yeah. you see it. The parent, both families were um, broken apart. They both ended in divorce. Uh, the one father committed suicide. I mean, it's awful what happened to these kids and to the families too. Um, and it affects everybody. It absolutely does. And again, if you, if you grow up and, and 
are able to repress so much for so long, it just becomes um, cyclical, generational trauma. You just pass on trauma from trauma to trauma until somebody actually has the, the courage and the skills to stand up and make it stop. Right. And like you said about the onion, you know, as you unpack and peel back those layers, these boys were so heavily groomed by Michael to not say anything that they lied for him. And they defended him for years, even um, perjuring themselves in court because they now are saying, you know, we admit we lied. We did it because we were groomed. Mm -hmm. And survivors understand this. You know, every time you see a trial, every time you see this happening and it appears that the witness is lying because they can't even get their story straight and their timeline isn't correct and all of this. But that's because of how trauma stores in your body. It doesn't store in your mind. And because the amygdala and the hippocampus go offline because they're flooded with chemicals at that fight or flight response, you can't plug it into the timeline. I mean, it's like it feels like it ha is happening right then. So yeah. for the victim, it's, it is like peeling that onion back. And it takes time to unpack that and to put it into sequence and make sense of it. it, it that's how it comes to the surface. Absolutely. So, for, for survivors, when we see that, we're like, yep, that's evidence that this is real. This, this person is not faking it. Yeah. And to break it down into chunks, too, some t uh, helps it become uh, t uh, manageable because you can, like, it's a, almost a tangible goal that you can reach if you set small goals along your way to healing. If you just say, okay, I'm going to be healed and after i read this 12-week course on cbt and i'm not healed after that then you have this whole um vision almost of what things should be like and living in the shoulda couldas is no good no <laughs> nope you know yeah, just live in the what is mm -hmm. yeah mindfulness and uh resiliency skills are really key to helping survivors um make positive gains. Um, I've actually never been diagnosed. Um, I would say I probably have uh, CPTSD based on what I can assess, but you can't assess yourself. So <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. But I am I'm a nearly licensed clinical mental health counselor. And you can assess yourself. <laughs> but I can't assess myself. So I, I admit that, uh, you know, it's fine. But if I were to try to get as close as I could, I would say that's probably what I have. Mm -hmm. But I don't like being stuck in PTSD for the rest of my life. I want to move towards um, healing and growth. So I actually lean more towards like say the post-traumatic growth model. That includes more mindfulness and more resiliency skills. So mm -hmm. I think start at PT post-traumatic stress disorder or, or CPTSD. But I think once you gain those skills and as you continue to grow and heal, you don't have to stay there forever. Yeah. You can say, you know what? No. I, I'm going to move towards this. I want to get further in my recovery. It's a spectrum. It, it doesn't, you don't have to be stuck. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, my friend, I'm going to wrap it up because we've been chatting for quite a bit, but I would like to have you on again because we are nowhere near done chatting. So, um, yeah, that would be awesome. I thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it was great to learn. I've learned a bunch of new things. I've got uh, new books to read. And I finally talked to you after three years of knowing you online. <laughs> so thank you thank so you. much. It's such a privilege, Jody, to, to speak with you. Uh, I appreciate your insights. You've given me a lot to think about. And uh, I just appreciate co-journeying with you. Uh, I think that's been a wonderful privilege. I think you do amazing work advocating for survivors and i thank you for all you do well thank you i appreciate it because i i try to help because i want to be like people like you i want to be ahead of my recovery so to speak you know a couple of steps ahead so thank you for being a good role model for myself and for a lot of men out there thank you Jody. okay we'll talk soon yes okay you take care of yourself you as well okay Well, as we wrap up the show, I would like to give a special thanks to our guest, Donald Cribbs, for sharing his time and his story with us. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please make sure to subscribe, 
so you never miss another episode. If you have any comments or questions or wish to be a guest on the show, you can message me at one last kick 71 on Twitter, Jody B B E E on Facebook or through my website, jodybetty.com. Links can be found on the podcast website. Thank you so much for spending your time with us. Hopefully we can help to eliminate or at least reduce the stigma around mental health. Until next time, take care and be well.